Welcome to The Summit Club, a weekly podcast series where I uncover the stories, the strategies, the pain and the elation behind the most highly performant people on earth. The Summit Club is based on one simple idea, that in the climb of life, there is no summit. Join me as we interview the very best performers across all human endeavors, as we uncover the tools and templates that they use to maximize their potential in their efforts to get to the summit. My guest today is Dale Hardiman. Dale is one of those people whose resumes is ludicrous for being such a young guy. As a master's certified registered osteopath, Dale is the founder and head of clinical practice at Hardiman Performance. But that's merely the tip of the iceberg. Dale is also a former Royal Marine, a professional MMA athlete, an Ironman endurance athlete, and a Web3 entrepreneur as the founder of the PA Club. No doubt something that we will dig into whilst competing in MMA, Dale was one of the training partners of quite literally the most famous brothers in the world right now. Andrew and Tristan Tate, who, as we speak, are currently sitting in a Romanian jail on alleged human trafficking offences. So as you can imagine, we potentially have got quite a lot to talk about today. Might just be round one of a multi-round thing. But Dale, welcome to the Summit Club. Tom, thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. Great to have you. Happy New Year. It's the start of 2023. Yeah, I know. 2023. It, the, the last year went so fast. Um, I'm pretty sure that I was sleep deprived for probably 70% of it. Um, there was a lot. There was a lot going on with training, with, with web free stuff, with the launch of the PA club, and with other, other stuff outside of side of work. Um, but I'm coming into this year hopeful. I've got a lot of plans, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, the new year is always a good time to to reset re-establish goals and, and push on again so I like the natural line in the sand that the end of the year causes so let's let's get it done I'm looking forward to it Dale it's like I'm the same in the same position uh I feel like I got no rest last year and I worked my ass off on so many things that I just look back and reflect and feel like I just probably was not working on the right things in the right direction do you ever do you ever feel that or do you ever think that Okay, I need to I need to be a bit smarter about where I spend my time. All the time. All the time. But the problem is with it is that you don't have that information until it till it's said and done, right? So you can look look back and reflect on these things and say, Oh, I could have done this better, or I was probably better off spending my time here and here. And they're good learnings to have, but at the at the time you didn't have that information. So it's very, very tricky when you're juggling the day to day. So I, I would say that what I do with that is I'll I'll look back and I'll think, you know, okay, I wasted time here, wasted time there. I won't make that mistake again, but I also won't beat myself up about the fact that I did that. Um, and I, I certainly won't look at anyone else's success or journeys and say, look, this person came into this space, for instance, after me and they're doing so much better here or here. I just don't, I just don't worry about that. I'll say, okay, like, you know, I can improve on this, this and this, and then I'll get to work and try and improve on it. But I, 100% resonate with you, mate, on that because I it's, I look back at things all the time. I think, could have done this, could have done that. But once again, I don't feel bad about it. I just use it as an opportunity to to move forward. And as we spoke about just before the before we got on, like kind of on air here, you were explaining how you didn't have much of a restful period over Christmas because you had a lot of work going on. Give a little bit of context as to kind of how, how your days are filled at the moment. What are you? What are you? What are you? What's taking up most of your time? Right, there's a lot of stuff going on. So um, currently, we are juggling a few different businesses and projects. So I am a I'm an osteopath. I still see patients um, within my clinic hard performance. I only see patients for two and a half days a week. I don't think I'm ever going to fully drop my clinical um, side of what I do. I really enjoy it. I, I get a lot of um, value out of spending time with people, helping them navigate issues that they're dealing with. Um, it also helps me to um it helps me to kind of learn from their mistakes as well you know there's a lot of people coming in and there's certain things happening in their lifestyle etc and it, that that the, le- the lessons i get from them i can apply to my life so and also i learn a lot about business from being with patients a lot about sport from being with patients we work with a whole different 
array of individuals from kind of amateur level to elite level athletes from um, people at the starting business to you know high level CEOs entrepreneurs etc so there's so much value to having conversations with these people every day and I get to spend maybe half an hour to an hour with certain individuals and I actually believe that sometimes I get more much more value out of the conversation than they do now they would say the opposite because I've given them the information specific to their health but honestly like some of the information I've got over the years from having a conversation in my practice is ridiculous so I don't think I'll ever drop that it's, it's almost like having a especially when you're when I've got kind of entrepreneurs in and stuff it's like having your own business coach coming in and he'll be like oh look you should do this try this but boom I did this and I'm just like okay I'll take that information boom. so it's, it's, it's perfect so we, I do about two and a half clinical days there I also spend a lot of time managing the practice um, and and running it we have a we have a manager in place but I will oversee operations. We had a, a lot of work done in one of the practices over the new year. So I was in project managing that. And then we have the, the PA club, which was um, a project that I set up with my co-founder Neo last year in Web3, which we um, aim to support and celebrate the PA community. Um, and we've so we're running that. We have a community manager in place at the moment. So the workload in terms of community management is not that heavy anymore. But we all, I also have a lot of stuff that we're building for that project and also stuff that's going to be related to that project that I'm building for the future personally as well um, in Web3 regarding healthcare. Um, and then I also have another couple of businesses that I don't really talk about publicly um, that, that uh, one of them service, they're both service based, but one goes into to offices. We provide healthcare to um, healthcare services to corporates. And then the other one is a, of, of all things, is a hair and beauty salon that I bought a few years ago. Um, and so that's run running in the background. We have a manager there and we're always continually making improvements there. And then I think, you know, my thing for this year really is I'm going to dive really into content creation um, and start putting some really meaningful content out there. Um, and certainly I'm going to be starting a podcast. So um, I'm looking forward to pushing forward with that. So I will talk about this a bit later, but there's there's a reason you're starting a podcast, and that's because you have an incredible history and story, and you have met some incredible people along the way. So you've got an amazing network to 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 tap into, and you just mentioned something about your clinical practice and how you never want to drop that because of the people you meet. Now I can kind of in a twisted way relate to that because uh, I posted about this on Instagram yesterday about how it's been eight years since I was a dentist and I used to work in a, in a, in a practice and I had my own, my own surgery, similar to how, how you will. The problem was um, I had my hands in their mouths for the entirety of the time they were in my, in my, pra in my room. <laughs> so I, I couldn't speak to them. Uh, if I did speak to them, I had to speak to them for, for, a minute, a few minutes at the beginning of uh, of one of the uh, the sessions, and then a few minutes at the end, and it was always just pleasantries. And I'm sorry, that was really painful, and yeah. <laughs> that that was a very different experience to what you get, which is people people are actually you can speak to you, you have time to talk about stuff. Um, so I I can relate to that. Um, but but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting how uh, slight similarities, but a big 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 difference. So that's yeah. why I'm doing what I'm doing now is I get to speak to you because I'd much rather be here um, pretty comfortable in my house and I get to speak to, to cool people. Um, and I'm not, uh, hopefully this isn't going to be painful for you, which is one of the challenges that, that I had. Not, um, not, not painful at all. Not painful. Not painful. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's actually talk about pain because you are, the truth is you're a man that undoubtedly has experienced um, probably more pain than probably 0.0001% of humans that have ever lived because of what you've done in, in your past history. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that because uh, from what I understand, the first profession that you had was in the military. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Um, what I did when I left school at 16 years of age, I decided I'd find something that was particularly very, very challenging for me. Um, and I joined the Royal, the Royal Marines. So I um, spent five and a half years in the Royal Marines. Amazing. Now, was there 
when you you said you left at 16 was there an intent to go for uh royal marines i have I have some friends who uh also been been in the marines um what, what was the decision process there was it was it clear to you that was where you wanted to go when i was at school i had no ambitions of joining the armed forces there was no there was no like family history i wasn't inspired by people in the armed forces i wasn't you know, you know some people when they grow up they like dream of being a soldier or a marine or whatever or something like that there was nothing like this there was no no one was pushing me to do it um what happened was i was in the final year of school and i was a super academic guy and the pathway for me was go to college go to university i was in this um gifted and talented group so it basically the gifted and talented program was a program that was run to for exceptionally bright individuals and in order to bring them through um, school, make sure they get the results that they deserve, and then push them into university programs, et cetera. Try and guide them through the early stages of life and put them into good colleges, good good universities. Now, I was in this program. We went around visiting universities and stuff when I was at school in year 10 and year 11. And then, but I, was, I, I always knew that I wasn't going to go down that pathway. I, can't, I was really bored of education. So... I started to look around elsewhere. And the only things that people were doing in my hometown, hometown of Luton, where people were going to, to college um, straight from straight from school, um, sixth form, or, or, or they will go to a technical college and learn a trade or something like that. That was kind of the, the pathways that were, that were set out. I come from a very working class background. And you know, I didn't know when I, was, when I was young, I didn't know any doctors. I didn't know any solicitors, lawyers. I didn't know any entrepreneurs. I didn't. I, I knew builders, and I knew, you know, people that worked in offices. I didn't know. I didn't know any other. You know, I didn't. And in fact, there was there was this idea that I would become a banker or an accountant. There was this idea that was floating around to me. When I was younger, I didn't even know what a banker or an accountant even did. So. I knew that an accountant was involved in tax, et cetera, but we didn't ever learn about tax when I was a kid. Um, and a banker, I assumed a banker was someone who worked in a bank when I was when I was 15 or 16. I didn't know that you could go and do investment banking, et cetera. I didn't, I didn't understand it. No one, no one ever taught it, taught it to me. My family didn't know. They weren't particularly well educated either. So I got to that point, <clears throat> the point where I had to choose. I actually applied for some, some apprenticeships um, and I got back out of probably like 50 letters that I sent out I got back two responses and both responses said no you're too bright to do this trade so I was predicted always in my in my <laughs> exam so it was just like you can't this is the wrong pathway for you so I was like okay well that's so what, what other choices have I got I started to look around and I stumbled across the armed forces I was inspired in, by, in 2003 by um by the Royal Marines that were um, in action in Afghanistan, a lot. Uh, uh, sorry, not Afghanistan, but Iraq. A lot of that was on the news. I also had a uh, my friend's older brother. His friend was in the Royal Marines, and I got talking to him at a Christmas party around their house, and he was talking, telling me about the Royal Marines and like all the crazy training they were doing and how hard the training was. And I was like, you know what, that sounds awesome. So I went home that between Christmas and New Year in Year Eleven, final year of school, and. I started to look into the Royal Marines and I went onto the computer and I was clicking around, poking around, and there was this all these physical challenges you had to do. I was like, okay, this sounds really hard. Um, so that night I there was like a three mile run you had to do in a certain amount of time to to go on to the PRMC, which is the pre um Royal Marines fitness test base. Essentially, you go down to Limston, which is the camp, and you do like three days of activity. So I was like, I'm gonna see if I can run three miles that far. So I went out and I uh, there was this, I used Google, I don't know if it was Google, but it was like plan my route tool on online. I don't know what it was. So I, I drew a lot like this circle around around my block. It was like roughly half a mile and I didn't have any watches or anything like that. The technology probably wasn't around then. And then I just, I went out and I just ran around this block six times and I timed it by looking at my clock before I left and then <laughs> on the wall. And then as I got back in, looking at it again, to see to see what the time was and I was like ah yeah that's roughly 22 minutes I would have passed that test and I was exhausted I borderline died um and that was it that was the catalyst for joining 
Wow. So was that your first kind of foray into physical stuff or, or had you, you know, you're clearly very intelligent and bright at school, but was the, you know, from the your the past like 15 years, like phys physical in uh, your endeavors have really been kind of the forefront of what you're do doing. Was, was that you as a kid as that well? Was, that was the start of it all. That was the start really? of it. Really? Yeah, exactly. That was the start. I was at that point, I was averagely fit. I used to play sport. Um, I was not great, but I used to be, you know, if I, if I was, if I was in a team sport, I was better at rugby than I was at football. So I was always kind of a, a staple in the team in, in rugby, but at football, I would, you know, I was, I was playing for the team, but if I was a sub and if I wasn't there one day, oh, it doesn't matter if Dale's not here. So like, it doesn't really add any value really. Like <laughs> we can replace him with someone else. I wasn't the fastest. I wasn't, I wasn't the strong. I, I was, I was starting to get stronger. When, when I hit puberty, I started to get strong. Um, like I naturally I started to get strong but I wasn't fit um, so when I was like wrestle with the lads I'd beat them wrestling and stuff like that so I started to get strong but I wasn't I had to train myself really to get physically yeah. in better shape and stuff so that was the beginning of it and then I just I just grew a a love for that feeling that feeling of being on the edge and pushing yourself and then I was just like okay well what can I do next what can I do next so this is this is really interesting to me because I've just finished reading the most recent book by David Goggins. So uh, for those that, that may not know, David Goggins is a, I think, former Navy SEAL. And uh, he's also been an endurance athlete, uh, world record beating endurance athlete for the last kind of 10, 10 or so, 10, 15 years. And uh, I look at his resume and it, it seems there's a lot of similarities to to what to what you've been through over the last kind of 15 years working in the military and going into endurance stuff. Um, interestingly in his book though he talks about being fueled by pain um and emotional pain psychological pain and that's the 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 fuel that drove him to uh to push himself to pass his limit time and time and time again can can you relate to that in any way i don't think so i don't think no. that um i don't think any of my actions would, were ever driven by from a place of pain um, I don't know what spurred me on originally to to join the Royal Marines. Really, like it was a kind of a very, you know, far to the flank decision. When I told my parents about it, they were like, "No, no, no you're not doing that." I was like, "I am, I am, I am doing it." They were like, "Oh yeah, whatever, they are, yeah, nice, good joke, nice one." <laughs> it was just like it was, I was, there was just like giggling around. So no, no, I'm genuinely joining the Royal Marines. They're like yeah talk to me about it later or something you know like, and then i i kept saying it they'll say look you're not, you, you, are you serious about this i said yeah i'm serious and they were like okay well you're not going to be able to join because we're not going to sign the papers so i was like well if you're not going to sign the papers i'll just wait a year and i'll sign them myself so i was stubborn um but no initially no it wasn't there was no motivation through pain but i have this i was kind of i, I have this something internally that it just wants it's just like a it's a driver in me i don't know what it is it just wants to continually improve that wants to wants to do better that wants to um, progress challenge myself in certain ways i don't i'm not comfortable just sitting around not doing an awful lot i just feel like i, I need to do stuff and physically i wasn't the best so i was like okay well this is a big challenge for me um doing physical stuff and trying to try to develop my physicality and then now it's very, very natural for me, but I'm like, okay, what can I do next physically to to push me? Um, but no, it wasn't about that. There was no, there was no pain motivation. And I know there is for for a lot of people. Although I have had like lots of traumas and stuff that have happened over the years, um, I wouldn't say that that drives the way the way I am as an as an individual in terms of um, what I do day to day. I don't think it does at all. And I I also believe that. A lot of people will use that as an excuse all of the time. So I love the idea that you can use that to to fuel your and fuel you and make you hungry and drive you on to spur you on to do good things. But I also I also hear a lot of stories and I speak to people about it all the time. Bear in mind I'm working with patients who are physically in pain. And um, now there's often often a lot of psychological components to that. We know that the human pain experience is not simply a um, tissue generated 
thing, phenomenon. There's it's a multifactorial experience, and there's lots of reasons why somebody could experience pain, and they all come together. Essentially, the person's a human, not a tissue. So, you know, speaking to people, I understand that to be the case, but I also find that often I, I, I like the idea of just saying, okay, this has happened. I'm going to deal with, deal with it now emotionally. For instance, when my dad died, um, he died five years ago, pancreatic cancer the his his like downhill kind of trajectory was very very fast he kind of got ill and within six months he died but that's a super traumatic life experience for me really close to him um love him to bits you know he taught me a lot but i cried that day when he died and i think the day after and i think probably a couple times in the following months when i was driving my car um on my own um i cried and and but i dealt with i i, I honestly dealt with the the, the emotions that people because i went i went back to work the next day i went back to work the next day i had patience i had responsibilities i didn't I, you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna die like, people are genuinely in pain i was helping them they don't you know bad they need to get back to work as well you know they've got things going on in their lives i i felt responsible to those individuals and also, I, I felt like sitting around at home during that period wasn't going to be helpful for me. I, ne- I needed to get back and, you know, get back to it and move on. Um, and people, and a lot of people said to me, oh, I don't know, you know, did you deal with that properly? You know, did you, you, you went back to work straight away? I was like, yeah, I, I dealt with it. And, and, you know, I think about my dad all the time. But I don't, I just, and that's just the way I process things. I don't feel the need to carry the baggage all of the time with me it just it just weighs you down and it, it gives you reasons not to do things and i'm looking for reasons to do things so it's, it's just a different it's just the way my brain works so i'm not I'm, i don't even take credit for a lot a lot of the ways that my brain works i just think that some some people's brains work in different ways and that certain people are naturally pessimistic and other, certain things will impact them in certain ways and other, others are just whatever it is, the way their physiology is made up, they think a certain way and they act a certain way and maybe they're more optimistic, et cetera. And that's, you know, for me personally, that's the way I have it. It's beneficial for me. So yeah, that's my long-winded answer on that one. No, I can relate to it because uh, reading this, reading the book by David Goggins, I'm thinking about, uh, it's something that I can't, I literally cannot relate to. I can't relate to, you know, being at the end of a marathon and, having pain or emotional trauma push me to the end it, it's just a feeling that i can't relate to and i think we're similar so I, I count myself extremely lucky that for whatever reason and it might be just the host of experiences that i've had on this earth um and i've had i've been very i consider myself very privileged for those of the experiences that i've had but i consider myself to have a relatively um for lack of a better phrase uh kind of a bulletproof mind um mm-hmm. i i don't get weighed down by um uh tragedy despite having experienced quite a lot of it um and emotional trauma and emotional experiences i typically can kind of compartmentalize and and move on quite quite rapidly do you we'll talk about this stuff in a little bit um because it's it's in the kind of the global sentiments at the moment there's something that has been thrown around a bit um uh, it's this uh this trope that we have like s- strong men uh create kind of good times good times create weak men weak men create bad times bad times create strong men do you do you relate to that in any way um i do, I do on a on a kind of law law of averages type thing i think that as a, at a societal level, I believe that that's the case. I don't think it's the case on the individual level. I think that a strong man can create another strong man to educate them correctly. But I feel like, yeah, certainly the harder times um, that maybe our grandparents went through um, created a, a different level of resilience to what we're seeing in some of the youngsters today. Not even some of the youngsters, some of the middle-aged people, you know, everyone. They're, they're, we've, we've, we've created this environment for ourselves that's particularly protected and um, quite comfortable, right? And the 
for the for the the rest of human e evolution, you know, up until this point, up until probably uh, post post World War Two, a lot of the conditions were very uncomfortable, um, and people become more more robust as a result. Yes, okay, life expectancy has increased, etc. But we can put that down to a couple of simple things: sanitation and antibiotics. That would that would do it. That would that would pretty much cover the reason why life expectancy is increased. Now we've got some more technology that keeps people alive a little bit longer, but that co that covers most of it. Um, so that's not that we're becoming more resilient. We're just our medical medical science is, is improving, and we can keep people alive a little bit longer. So yeah, I, I do I do prescribe to that notion that um, if you if you're you have to, I, think, I believe you have to be exposed to challenging challenging circumstances now it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be involved in hardship and such but you don't it doesn't mean that okay because someone's from a more privileged background they can't be as mentally resilient as someone from a less privileged background that's that's too simple but i think i believe you can you can expose yourself to hardship in a myriad of ways but you might you, you might find that hardship in in sport Okay, you might do a sport that's particularly challenging, and that might help you to build up some psychological and physical robustness that's going to help you in life. You might um, do, you know, there's all there's all a mirror. There's a million different ways you could you could do it, but I, I I do believe that I do believe that people are a little bit softer. I think it's just the environment in general. I also believe that we're we're getting a little bit too sensitive on a lot of issues at the moment, and. I don't believe that's sustainable. I think we'll come full circle on it, but we're we're kind of at the getting closer to the to the peak of all the BS at the moment. Um, but I believe people are starting to get fed up with it as well. Yeah. So yeah. people, you know, at the end of the day, like at the moment, you you've got to be super careful what you say to people. Certainly, what you publish online, like it only takes one tweet that you've put out there that people take badly that offends the wrong people and all of a sudden accounts deleted you might have spent the last three four five six ten years building your account all of a sudden you've gone from being super nice guy bigger yeah racist you know whatever 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 it is that you've said boom 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 this you get labeled or something people latch onto it people online are absolutely brutal and, I've, and now that i'm diving more onto the online you see this uh pettiness somewhat um squabbling and i, I haven't got time for time for, for all that i i, I like to I, I someone told me many years ago i was speaking to a mentor of mine and he said to me that you have to try and make every interaction you have with humans no matter what the circumstances are you have to try and make it a net positive interaction. So you, you don't want to be going around creating all these net negative interactions with people every day. But like sometimes you're not going to be able to manage it. Something's happened, circumstances, etc. But you have to do your best to leave a positive mark wherever you go. And that, I've always I've always thought about that when when I'm doing things. And now that sometimes you know you can. You can have an opinion on something that's maybe people perceive as negative, but you can still have a positive, leave a positive mark in their mind. The way you communicate the message, the way you discuss it, the way you explain it. Um, you can even, I, I, people have messaged me about stuff before that I've put on Twitter. I said, I'm, I'll, I'll just, be, I'll just message them back on the, on the, in the comments or in their DMs and say, pop me a message. I'm happy to discuss that more. And I'll discuss it with them. And then they're like, thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. So they may not agree, agree with my point, but they may not agree with my message. But once they discuss, discuss it with me, they're saying, actually, this is coming from a good place. This person's educated on this subject. They're not just speaking nonsense. Um, and actually, there is more detail to it. But you can't put that into, what is it, 140 characters, whatever it is on, on a tweet. Um, so pe people, so yeah, that's that one thing that I learned. But do, yeah. I, th I believe at a society level, definitely we're in a, a period of time at the moment that maybe we're a little bit less resilient than we than we, we need to be. We're talking about resilience. Let's talk a little bit about your military career and how, if if anything, my experience with, with friends uh, who have been in the military, they end up leaving and 
they uh, end up having a lot of habits that seemingly line them up for a successful life as whether it's in business or entrepreneurship um do you can can you relate to that at all um was there anything anything in the military in your in your military career which you felt kind of has helps you now that you can rely on and then a little bit about your transition into what you did next which was pretty crazy yeah i would say i would say all of it <laughs> um everything that i learned i joined the royal marines and royal marines are an elite fighting force you're around people that are very ambitious very fit very strong very resilient um and you spend long periods of time around these people or that you become a family you're with them 24 7 so and you go through this very arduous long training cycle that that does essentially change you as a human um you would be i i, I it, it can't it can't not change you it, it, it completely changes the way you are because you're essentially going in there as a normal person, a right? person with no experience in combat or violence and stuff. And what they're doing is taking normal fit lads that want to join the armed forces and they're turning them to people that are capable of killing. So to do that, you have to put them through a certain, certain regime, right? You have to make them, um, you know, a certain way you have to be you have to test them in, in, in certain ways you have to you have to know during training that, that this person that you're 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 training that you're that that person when when it comes when it gets really bad that they're still going to be there that they're still going to push forward that they're still going to uh, they're going to continue fighting they're not going to run away they're not going to hide so the raw marines training is very very specific in the fact that it's it's looking to challenge you physically, emotionally, psychologically. Um, you know, you, you spend long periods of time hungry, sleep deprived, um, cold, wet, all these things that are that are gonna that are gonna cause people to break down physically and emotionally. And then the people that are able to carry on, you know, and function will will progress through training. And I think the we, you end up losing probably a lot of probably potentially good good soldiers and good marines in the process i suppose people that potentially could be but it's, this is not this is not a bodybuilding contest this is not um how can this person function when we're in optimum conditions this is about can this person function in the worst conditions possible when they're hungry when they're tired so we can all run a marathon when we're fully fueled and we've done all the training and we've we've got um, all the sleep and preparation and we've got the right gear but can you run a marathon when you're not fueled tired you haven't slept in in two days you haven't you haven't eaten you've you've got boots on you've got kit on can you run a marathon then can you get to the to the rendezvous point when you're feeling like that are those the people that are fantastic soldiers or marines or going to be special forces and stuff and you you'd think oh, okay these guys are probably really huge muscly some of them are some of them are, you look at them and think they're scrawny they're not they're not very big at all um but they can carry a load of weight and they can keep going and they can soldier on through you know for hours and hours on that so why even this year when i did i did my iron man this year i was supposed to do iron man uk and I, I did. I went there, but I had, to, I ended up having three punctures. And I had to pull out the race forty miles in, um, because my tire had ripped, and I, I couldn't get a new tire. And I, was, I wasted an hour and a half, like between changing the punctures and stuff, and trying. And I had to beg someone for a, another inner tube because I only had two inner tubes, and I put another one in. But so it was an absolute nightmare. And then I ended up then booking another race three weeks later. But the problem was that race coincided with the launch of the PA Cup. So the week I was launching the PA club, I had a race on the Sunday. Bear in mind, we started minting on the Friday. So that week, I had about 15 hours sleep the whole week. And then I went, I went and raced an Ironman on, on the Sunday morning. That night, the Saturday night, you can go onto my Twitter, you can see, I was tweeting. I was hard tweeting right up until the small hours of the morning, uh, probably one o'clock in the morning. I woke up at three o'clock in the morning got a shower had some water got my kit down to down to the race i raced when i started my legs felt very hollow 
I felt sick in the morning. I was like, this is going to be a terribly long day. I knew, I knew it was going to suck. I knew it was going, it was going to be horrible. But I got into it. I swam. I, had, I put in an okay swim. I had a really, really good cycle despite the wind. And I really struggled on the run. I blew up a little bit. I was struggling to fuel. But I just persevered. Persevered. Kept running, kept running. Got to the end. Beat my time from the year before by an hour. Um, so it was, it was good going, but it weren't nowhere near what I was capable of. But, you know, it wasn't perfect conditions, but I got it done. And that's, and that's the, a lot of people would have been like, oh, you know, I've actually, this, this week it's been a bit too crazy with the PA club launch and stuff. I'll just stay in bed till, I mean, I, I, do you know what? I'm not saying it didn't cross my mind. I'm not saying that I didn't feel that I want to be comfortable. We all have this natural driver to want to feel comfortable. But it's about not letting that get in the way of what you're trying to do. So I, I, want, I wanted to stay in bed. I don't want my alarm went off. <laughs> I didn't want to get up. I was like, oh, I've run an Iron Man today. This is going to be brutal. I was like, if I just stay in this hotel bed, no one's going to know. I can make up some BS excuse. I could be like, oh, you know, I woke up and I, I started to start to move. Oh, my back started hurting. You know, or I've got, I've got chest infection. I can make something up. When I did Iron Man UK earlier on in the year. I had, um, so I don't know if you know the story, but I had two eye infections. No. Conjunctivitis in both eyes. Oh. Barely, barely see. Um, so swimming was absolutely horrendous. The day before, I was opening up my, uh, opening up a gel, putting it into a water bowl, and I snapped my tooth. I had this, I had this bridge on, on my front teeth from, from years ago when I got my teeth knocked out in an MMA fight. And, I was uh, day before I man UK. The night it was the evening, like nine o'clock. I opened up the gel, snap, my tooth snapped off. I was like, "Fuck!" I was like, "I don't, <laughs> I can't go anywhere. I can't go and get it fixed." So I went down to the su- the, the local supermarket. And I bought some super glue. I glued it back on. And the next day I raced. I knocked it in. It was twisted. So it was. And I remember when I finished because because I my bike just busted and I had to pull off. Um, on that race, I then was going through like the the tent to go um, to bring my bike through and to to check out and stuff. And I was speaking to the lady, and she was looking, at me and I had these bright red eyes, right? Super bright red eyes. My tooth was all banged up and twisted. Um, she was like, "Are you okay?" I was like, "Yeah, I feel completely fine." She was like, "No, no, no. sit sit down." Sit down. I was like, no, "No, no, honestly, I feel completely fine. It's just I've got a bit of an eye infection." And yeah, I know I look a bit weird with my tooth and stuff, but literally, if it's not a physical thing, my bike's busted, I feel fine. And she was like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, I'm fine, don't worry. So yeah, these things happen. It's It sounds as if like your experiences, I, I'm guessing in the military, they pushed you so far beyond your limits time and time again, where you now know, you know, you know that you you can keep going right you know that under any circumstance you've got more in the tank do you think there's a level of kind of fulfillment hunting where you're like i know if i push myself if i push myself through this all this shit and test my limits again push past my limits again i'm gonna feel pretty good at the end of it or after i think so yeah i think so that is definitely definitely doesn't make you feel bad after after getting a win over yourself um i think that yeah i mean i i would agree with that even this year i was at the start of sorry last so 2022 i'm in the new year this year so last year at the start of the year i had covid i ended up having long covid for three months and i couldn't really train wow um like, i couldn't breathe i was super fatigued i still got on with everything and stuff but i was still trying to train and i couldn't really i wasn't getting any performance out of myself and I've had I've got I had a new coach from the September of the previous year. So he'd seen me up until Christmas, super keen athlete, boom, boom, hitting all my sessions. This happens, massive downhill decline. I was struggling to train, couldn't get any performance out of me. And I was just like, look, I'm gonna keep the race in, I'm gonna try and push towards it. You know, I don't know how it's gonna go, blah, blah. Anyway, so there was a big turnaround point around March, April time where I was able to ramp back up again. But my, my fitness wasn't as good as it would have been if I would have kept going through that period. And I remember speaking to my coach, the, and he doesn't know me personally. He just knows from the data. Because I can have calls with him and stuff like that, but I just don't bother. I'm, I'm, 
I, I just want I just want the technical information. I, I, like it sounds strange. It sounds bad. Sound. I don't want another friend or like, I, I want. I just want the technical information so I don't have to think about it. So that I can just I don't have to plan my workouts. So I'll just go and hit them right. So rather than me, because I can program my own workouts, but I don't want, I don't want to spend hours and hours programming my my workouts. I want someone else to do it, be able to look at the data and then, then check make the changes. So he was speaking to me before before the event, and he was he said he goes what time are you going for etc. I started talking to friend. He's like he goes you haven't done enough training, and I was like he goes yeah you would you would easily smash through those through those times if you would have committed to the process <laughs> committed to the process done more training but it's like you haven't done enough training to justify it. i said look that might be the case for other athletes that you, you work with they might need more training but i'll be fine <laughs> so he i i, I said i told him how what what, what is you're going to be cycling to he said you, you haven't shown that in training but i said i can do it and i did it <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no data to support your claims there's no, there's no, we haven't got any data to support your claims that you can do it. So I said I can do it, I will do it in the race and he's like, I said I'm not I'm not an act like I'm not just someone who's random random that you train, I've got a background in doing hard picks I know, I know my body I know, I know how to pace it when I'm doing stuff I naturally know how to do it because I've done enough hard things over the years when I'm in the moment, I know how to distribute my energy. Yeah. He said, oh, well, you know, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. And it went fine. But yeah, the, uh, the, yeah. so the, the data doesn't give you everything, right? You know, yeah. You, at the end of the day, when it comes to these events, there's a strong psych psychological component to them. Um, and I remember at Ironman UK the previous year, there was, it was horizontal rain, like biblical, like really bad, four hours of terrible rain when we was on our bike leg. And I was cycling, and I was like, this is cold and I'm wet, but I, I've experienced this before. Not on a bike, I've never cycled in that condition, in conditions before, but in general, I've cycled in, I've been in really bad conditions and been cold and wet loads of times. And I could see people as I was cycling, and they were broken. Now, these are super good athletes, right? We're talking about the top 100 athletes at the right, from the race, right? Broken, broken. People were broken. And I was like, ah. This is a, this is a, I'm lucky here. I've had these experiences before, and this doesn't feel that bad to me because I know at the end of the day, I'm going home to get a shower. I'm going to have some food. I'm going to a warm bed. I just have to persevere for a few hours. Like it's not bad. Whereas you know, when you're in the moment, obviously it feels bad, but <laughs> of course it's going to be fine. When, back in the day, like you know, when I was in the armed forces, for instance, this is what it really did change me psychologically. I, I, you might be in that sort of conditions where you're thinking, I've still got another three, two to three weeks of this. Yeah. Of being cold, wet, and hungry. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a different, it's a different thing. Yeah. Well, not many people on earth have been in the military. Like, not many people on earth have been an Iron Man. But even fewer people have stepped into an octagon with the intent to severely damage. Se severely hurt uh, inflict a lot of pain and potentially kill people what are those 30 seconds like mm -hmm. before the referee claps his hands together and you go at it what are you thinking about very intense mate that, that those those moments um before the bell goes before you fight is super super intense now the, the real intensity starts to build up in the in the change room beforehand, but it really peaks at the point that you're getting your Vaseline put on your face and as you're walking into the cage. And at that moment, you know, I'm, once you're in there and the referee shuts the door and he's in between you, and bearing in mind you're doing, they're doing announcements, they're shoving the camera in your face, um, and then you're, uh, you know, on set basically thinking, okay, it's, it's go time. And it's it's super intense. Like it's it's one of those experiences that that you you're not going to get. You're not going to find that level of fear in in many situations. It's not often that people put themselves in that in that type of situation. Even in Afghanistan, when you when you get involved in kind of five you know in contacts you know, and people are shooting etc. Now that's something that happens, right? So you've gone out to patrol. 
boom, the bullets start flying, and then you're in the moment. Now, you kind of, when you're going out of trouble, you know that potentially that's going to happen. You're, good, you're trying to advance the, the area of control or something like that. So you're pushing into enemy territory. So you know that potentially it could happen. I mean, it does. But there's something about that kind of one on one. Hold on, I'm going to fight someone who's a trained professional fighter who's trained to specifically hurt me. Um, it's scary. It's scary. But there's no, there's no there's no feeling like it. one of the most one of the most intense and real human experiences you can ever have. Yeah, and the, and the experience that yeah the the reality is is that probably the smallest percentage on earth will ever experience that fear, the scare, the scariness, uh, the anxiety and the tension. Um, let's talk a little bit about the kind of the, the training, the training that you did for MMA. Uh, you cross paths with one of the most notorious people on earth right now. And kind of, you sp spoke about this earlier in, in the bio, uh, you were one of the training partners. At, I understand storm gym um, with Andrew and Tristan Tate who for the last year have been uh, the most uh, the, the most infamous brothers on earth especially across social media um they uh, andrew notoriously was cancelled from uh, most social media platforms uh, got his bank accounts frozen and is currently uh, under arrest in romania um after being uh, kind of uh, having uh, there's allegations of him being involved in human trafficking uh, which he has uh, previously talked about um uh, in uh, in the press there aren't many people on earth that know him as well as you that's the truth yeah um is andrew tate a good guy yeah i I've, I've, I've never seen anything in andrew tate's character uh, more tristan than for that matter that would lead me to believe that these allegations are are true. We grew up in a town called Luton. Luton is a, a very uh, almost kind of deprived, very deprived in certain areas. Um, it's a town that that a lot of crime does generate from. Um, there's a lot of organised crime in our town. We all, all the everyone that grew up in Luton that that know that know people that have a big network know a lot of criminals. I've never seen any evidence that supports the idea that Andrew and Tristan are involved in organised crime. Bearing in mind, I trained, I spent thousands of hours with them. We, I knew a lot of people involved in crime when I was a fighter. Also, also the uh, the kickboxing, boxing, MMA worlds. There's a lot of criminals within that space, right? The type of people that are willing to go in there and fight people are also willing to take risks on other stuff in life, okay? Naturally, by the nature of... So that's not to say everyone involved in those sports are criminals, if, it, because that's not the case, because I've never been involved in any crime. I've never seen it. I've never seen anything in their character that makes me believe that that's the case. Now, you see all these allegations come out, and I, I, when, I, when I see the, 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 the arrest of that, it upset me. I was like that's, like, that's it's heartbreaking to see people that you know publicly um, displayed and presented in a certain way when, when you know them personally in a different way. Um, so it's tough to see. I've never seen any evidence of it. I just don't believe that they're that stupid. They're very intelligent people. That's 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 another thing. These these are very very intelligent men that understand a lot about the world and how it works, or clearly understand a lot about business. Andrew being potentially one of the greatest marketers <laughs> of our generation. Absolutely, no one says that. He's one of the most brilliant marketers of yeah. ever seen. Like he's yeah. the the top G character, right? I'll call it is one of the greatest attractive character market plays of of witness on social media. Yeah, I I I think you would have to ha it would have to be number 1. I think um it's uh, it, yeah, it's a, absolutely. He's um he, he managed to become the most highly searched name and term of last year of 2022, uh, which is is no mean feat. And yeah, very uh, 
I think unarguably you can't, you, you, yeah, you cannot argue that he is a, an exquisite marketer um, and businessman and clearly very intelligent. Now, without diving too deep down the rabbit, rabbit hole, his arrest and the circumstances around his arrest, uh, he has kind of been predicting for months, um, if not longer than that, that uh, he talks about uh, he talks about the matrix. And this is something that is also talked about in a lot of like young creators, young, typically young men um, who potentially have seen his content and uh, talk a lot about the matrix and that we live in the matrix and that the controllers of the matrix are the people that have ended up putting him in jail. Um, and he couldn't do anything about that. No matter who 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 is out there, um, they are potentially at risk from being put under the control of the matrix. Do you believe in the matrix? Well, not you know the matrix as a as a concept. I mean, I think that's uh, you know the label of it being the matrix. Of course not. But in terms of the idea that that governments can come together, that the press work in in unison, that there is corruption within within the systems as a whole. I hundred percent believe it. Yeah, it don't, you don't have to go far to find that information. It's all publicly available. Like it's not like now how far does that go is the is the question. Um, do I believe that that governments, that politicians, that press will, would act um, very um, significantly in order to protect their interests. Yeah, of course I do. Well, this, this, there's, 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 that's of course that's going to happen. You know, that's this. It's always been the case throughout human history. Okay, the the inter interesting thing we've got at the moment is that you've got the the introduction of the internet has changed the way that we communicate forever and if you if you look at it from a from a a, a standpoint from maybe what andrew would talk about and bear in mind i don't i don't engage with a lot of his lot of his content overall um i, I i've watched quite a bit of it and i agree with a lot of stuff he says there's certain things i don't agree with um if you if you think about the kind of the internet and if you go from a um, a skeptical standpoint to say actually the internet was the perfect way to control the masses to get information out there to the masses and to to create a certain narrative now that's that's all well and good when you can con you can actually control the information but once once you lose control of the narrative. The internet becomes the weapon against you. It becomes the, the the fast spreading virus that you don't want it to become. So do, do I believe that people that speak? I mean, there's there's there's, there's obvious. You know, say for instance, um, there's loads of people on, on online that, that are shadow banned that you have to specifically type in their their name. To, to get onto their get onto their page. In fact, you search for them, can't find them unless you click on something that they posted um, on different social media platforms. And you think, hold on, why are they even? Why are they back? What what are they? And it's almost like, hmm, like there is a lot of elements of control being had from social media companies. Now, where where's that where's that direction come from? Who knows? It might be their own individual policies. Are they working together? Uh, but no, I do believe that there are, there is, it's, it's hard. It's without a sound, it's, it's very, very tricky. Because I think, to I speak to people about this, like, and a lot of people will touch on different subjects of it, and then of this kind of matrix, or like ruling elite, or um, uh, I don't know, corruption. And they'll, and they'll understand different bits of it. If, even in, 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 if I go on stick to a subject that I'm really familiar with and, and talk about medical literature, um, then we know that the uh, for a long lo longest period of time, 
pharmaceutical companies were were producing you know the, 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 well you know the pharmaceutical companies control the medical literature they're the ones with the money they're the ones that can fund research they're the ones that can carry out research now there's probably no surprise that the the largest intervention that happens within medicine is pharmacological it's it's, it's tablets it's you know injections they control they control the literature and it, it, there's a good book um, by ben goldacre um called bad pharma and he also wrote a book called bad science and he talks about the the corruption within pharmaceutical companies and he talks about the i think it was maybe a few quite a few years ago that pharmaceutical companies didn't have to register any of their research prior to conducting it so i, and I believe this is in america i have to go back and look at it but they so essentially they could carry out 10 studies 10 different trials and once they get the one bit of one study that supports their narrative they'll publish it and then they'll just do that again and again and again now all that data from the other nine see you later gone and they'll just push a certain narrative a certain this drug is beneficial for this if you look at all the a lot of the drugs and you look at the numbers needed to treat and which basically means like how many people you need to treat in order to get a positive response and numbers need to harm how many people you need to treat to get the negative negative response harmful a lot of these drugs have got real high numbers needed to harm like they, they've got like like you've got for instance you like you know it only takes one, one in a hundred people are going to get a harmful effect from it, or one in 50 or what like paracetamol not either for instance has got quite a high also a low number of needed car. So it's very, very common for people to get side effects from it. Um, but it's very, very commonly used medication. It's also quite good for a lot of very a variety of different things. So I know that that happens within within research. I know that also when you're trying to publish even more lower lower level stuff, there's control over what gets published in medical journals, you know mates favors all this type of stuff you know this you know and there's also but like, there's a certain there's always something behind that's driving it so i was reading some really interesting um uh twitter feed yesterday about this 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 whistleblower has come out talking that he used to work for coca-cola and he's talking about how coca-cola used to pay um pay groups in order to and target other groups to in order to basically to get the narrative across that sugar wasn't bad for you, that it didn't cause diabetes and obesity, etc. Um, and it, it, these were it, these were the conversations that were happening happening in boardrooms, openly, right? Everyone was probably non-disclosure agreement, sign this, don't talk about it. So if corruption exists. And we can visibly see it at that level. I don't have any doubts that it exists <clears throat> in the areas that we can't see or don't understand. Yeah, it's it's funny because I one of the main reasons I left the medical profession, and it's it's just challenging for me to talk about because I have a lot of family and friends who are who still work with in the medical profession. Um, but in the the short kind of eighteen months that I I practiced, I I saw a lot of corruption. Uh, I saw a lot of a lot of clinicians who may would make very would make uh, unethical decisions um, about their practice, um, and it was typically related to it was the link between them making a a, a treatment recommendation uh, that would potentially be more lucrative. Uh, I saw that way too obviously, way too frequently, and it completely uh, it grinded very directly against my intent to always provide the best care that I could possibly give to my patients. And it became super clear to me super quick that those two things were just not going to work out for me. Um, I, I, I would never be able to forego my my ethics to. Um, to 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 make a living 
Um, and so that to me was, it became a very clear or, or an obvious decision I needed to make, which was, this isn't for me. Um, and uh, so I, I can, I can very easily see how there is, there is corruption in humans. Sadly, that is, uh, I, I believe there's a couple of things that, um, we don't talk about as humans very often, but humans, in my opinion, are incredible liars. And uh, if anything, that is one of our most impressive human natures is our ability to lie. And, um, yeah, I, it, it just, uh, I, I can relate very deeply, deeply have to you, that. Have you read the book talking with strangers about Gladwell? Actually, no, I haven't. I haven't even heard of uh, he talks about that. that, that no, book. Humans Talk have a default um, mechanism, a, a mechanism that's built in that they often will always, when talk, when building relationships, they default to truth. And the reason, and so basically, when even, so this is why people can lie and deceive people so well because our natural instinct is to, the, 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 to tell us that the person's telling the truth. And the reason why that's beneficial is humans. Now, if you, if our natural instinct was to think that person's lying every time if that was our natural instinct then it's not very good for building a society is it humans would, ne would never have been so successful as as we are in the animal kingdom if we if we suspected foul play from everyone so we have this inbuilt mechanism that we default to truth now this is this is the reason why corruption can be so interlaced into the system because we can say no way the government wouldn't do that. That person wouldn't do that. That person's not like that. But you don't know. We don't know that the case. And we know that humans naturally default to truth. So we, we believe that that person is truthful. And there's certain people in history that have been whistleblowers and that have, you know, put them put their head above the parapet and, you know, they're getting bullets thrown at this, sniped at them. Now, that's not a, a beneficial trait to being, to fitting in within a pack. The, you know, at school, the grass, no one likes the grass at school, the little rat, the weasel, right? So this is not a beneficial social trait to have because that, that, that person that then becomes an outlier within the community because the community wants it all to run smoothly. So you don't want, you know, so, we, so there's not a lot of people that are naturally whistleblowers, um, grasses etc but you do need those people within the system because without them we can all be led down one path yeah we need people to flag things up they might not be liked we may not like their opinions on things we may challenge our beliefs but we need them we need that we need them to flag things up that discrepancies that are in things that we that we're not going to consider because our natural default is to believe that they're telling the truth so they're, yeah. they're important. And, and, and when you touch on the uh, medical ethics, we've always run our practice super ethically to do the best we can for our patients. Um, I talk about this a lot on social media. Um, I, it, I talk about it a lot with patients in person. It literally drives me mad. Some of the recommendations, the scaremongering that goes on, um, the, 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 the unnecessary treatments that happen. And you can see it, like people think it wouldn't happen, right? But I've seen it time and time again where people have been referred to a uh, spinal console and not by myself, but by a GP or something. They've got back pain. They've had back pain for a few days or a week or something. It's quite bad. They go and get an MRI. They see some some changes on, on the scan. And then there is surgery a couple of days later. All because we can charge the insurance company. This is the problem with the with the with a, a purely insurance-based model. What it, what it leads to is unnecessary investigations unnecessary interventions all the time and you and, and what that what that leads to is we know in, in the states because we, we can watch that model and learn its lessons it leads to a very expensive healthcare very expensive healthcare obviously it leads to health poverty if people can't access the care as well but it leads to expensive healthcare that yes the, the healthcare providers get paid well but it also will lead to improvements in some aspects of care like technology will develop but actually, you have to argue, is the patient in the majority of situations getting better care or are they getting care that's unnecessary for them? So I, the, amount of, the amount of people I see that have medical insurance that think it's great that they can get a scan immediately, yes, it is if you've got cancer. But if you've got a knee pain and you scan it and they see something, 
it, that might lead you to having surgery. If you didn't need surgery, you needed to, you know, move your knee a little bit, take a little, deload it a little bit, and then build back up. That's all you needed. You would have been recovered in four or five weeks. Now you've had the surgery, you have to wait six weeks until you're kind of able to walk again and then like, properly, and then you probably got, you know, three or four months recovery from that point. You might have had to take time off work. It's just unnecessary. It's expensive and it's not required. So, um, yeah, I see it all from all the different standpoints. Yeah, it's I can. Uh, it's funny because we both got as both like clinical uh, clinical professionals. Uh, I know for a fact that if my uh, and I do, I have experienced some back pain, um, and I can kind of I can I can work around it and and treat like I can moderate it myself and i understand ish why it's happening but i know for a fact that if it got to a point where i felt like i needed to see someone and and it was debilitating i'd be coming straight to you before i'd be going to a doctor yeah it's and and i'm guessing you know i'm sure that you probably have a very similar uh philosophy on you know if things go wrong you've got an idea of who you're going to first 100%. 100%. And it's, it's interesting, Mark, because it's tricky sometimes because sometimes you'll be you'll be working with a patient and you're and we've always, always got super ethical. Do we're basically saying to the patient, look, this is the path. This is what the path we need you to walk, right? Okay. So we try we we try and save them as much time as possible, make it easier for them, explain everything, did, you know, take away all the fears and anxieties around it. Um, no fear monger at all. And, and then so, and patients sometimes will recover it and they've got this appointment booked with a GP anyway that they've been waiting for or with a, you know, they have an X-ray that they're, they're waiting for, et cetera, because they, they had it booked before they had, had started working with us. And they'll go and have the X-ray and then they'll ring me up and they'll be like, oh. like they're ringing me up like I've missed something. Like, so like, and they're, they're saying, oh, you know, I've got, they might have had hip pain for a year and now they're starting to feel really good and they're starting to recover it's dying down and they're back to getting back to their life and oh yeah it turns out it was arthritis after all and i'm like thinking you're 60. obviously you've got wear and tear of your body like you've got some changes internally to wear and tear is the wrong word you've got some change that's the old word now really but you've got changes internally much like you have wrinkles and gray hair, you know, this is, there's no surprises here. I did explain this to you three, three weeks ago, or a month ago, two months ago, however long ago it was. Um, there's no requirements to scan you, you would get better. But the only reason we would scan you in this instance is because if we suspected something that would change the treatment plan dr- drastically, if I suspected infection, if I suspected um, malignancy, something like that, you know, some other systemic condition. Yes, we would investigate. If I suspected that the hip wasn't going to recover, it was too too far down down the line, that we need to have more drastic intervention escalate, like surgery or something like that. So so I've had people right, that then they're bringing me up and I'm, and I'm thinking, so now they've been told they've got arthritis and they're told bone on bone, bone on bone arthritis. Scary, right? And I'm thinking, I can't get this information out of their head. Yeah. No matter what I say now, yeah. no matter how much I reassure them and say, look, you were doing very well before, you know, you were improving, your quality of life's improving, you're back to all the tasks that you want to do, etc. You're not in any pain anymore. I can't get that out of the head. I've had people, right? So I, I have managed to, to 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 turn quite a few people around, loads of people, but I've had people that have then gone and had surgery where they don't need it. Oh. And it's almost like you, I exist here, okay, and then whatever it is that the, the information that is outranked me in the in the medical scale of people of importance. So you got like musculoskeletal healthcare practitioners, GPs, consultants. GP, I said something. So now most people now like a lot of my patients realise that is what the GP says is not necessarily true. So they'll believe me over it. But the consultant, the specialist, the specialist of all people, specialist in surgery. Uh, but that, unfortunately, they rank, they rank quite highly on the 
on the uh, on the ranking system. Well, we uh, humans have always existed in hierarchies, right? So the consultant says this, unless it's a patient I really know, they'll be like, okay, what's they'll say? But patients I don't really know that much. Oh, the consultant said this, but I shouldn't be doing this. So it's, it's very hard to get that information out of their heads. Very, very hard. It's kind of frustrating because for me and you, <laughs> and when we're in, when we're when you're a clinician, we're we're the only ones that know this, right? We're we're the only ones that actually understand that it doesn't matter where you are in the hierarchy. Like, and there's a great example of this in from a content creation perspective. There's a guy on YouTube. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. A guy called Derek. More plates, more dates. Um, so he. I've seen I've seen the more plates, more dates. But I've not not seen. So, I don't know. yeah. So he's he's the guy that um uh he is a uh he he is not medic medically or clinically trained um in any way, but has probably uh you know point zero zero one percent uh expertise within uh kind of uh the 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 realm of uh of hormonal treatment and how the how hormones affect the body at a kind of molecular level and people will go to him for expertise before going to a medical professional and uh, especially for people like us we know that there are a lot of charlatans out there and uh, a lot of charlatans that have just they've just stayed the course and they've got to a point in a position where for them the decision is either do i make more money or do i treat the patient how they need to get treated and and nine times out of ten the money thing that's the the decision swayer uh so with me and you are the lucky ones because we know how that works we know the system is set up like that so we are cynical and we are we will hunt the right people to get the right advice and the right treatment but for 99.9999 percent of the world they don't have that luxury and it's a little bit scary especially for me friends and family i i try and make sure that if people come to me i'm like okay well go and see this person who i know will give you the they will treat you the correct way uh, but we're lucky we no, most yeah, people you know, don't like, have that. You just, you just reminded me of something uh, that I was thinking about the other day. And you know, like you go on like a, a market in like a, like a squeeze page for a, a product yeah. or something like that. Um, and I'm on the squeeze page, and I'm, I've learned a lot about marketing. I've spent, you know, spent a lot of time studying it, understanding it for business purposes, just in general. I think it's really interesting, um, just as how you communicate messages and stuff. You go onto the squeeze page, I'm looking at it, I'm like, surely no one's buying this surely like you know this you know you know guys are sweet it's like you could keep scrolling forever and it's just got <laughs> this different coffee like you know, this, yeah this, testimonials yeah yeah, 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 yeah all this yeah. you know like a typical yeah, yeah. Like, uh, also, also like a traditional squeeze page um i'm like i'm looking at it thinking ah, no way is anyone but but then then i have to take come out of my head a bit yeah but all these people haven't studied market. Yeah. These people don't even know that they're being marketed to or sold to. In, and really, they're just interacting with the content. And I, and I, ha I have to do that a lot with, with recommendations I make as well. Like, remember, mm. don't assume knowledge here. Yeah. Just because it's super, super basic for me, real basic concept, doesn't mean this person understands it at all. They don't have any of the information. So even when I try and say to someone, look, your, I don't know, back pain is multifactor. But they're, they're, they're coming at me and they're telling me there must be a joint out of this. I'm saying, no, 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 that's, that's not possible. That's not. <laughs> Joints don't come out of place unless they're dislocated and you've damaged the ligaments. Yeah. Me doing a spinal manipulation is not popping anything back in. And, and, and so they're saying me the joints out of place. Every time I go and see a chiropractor, this is what someone will tell me quite often. I go and see them once a week. They pop it back in, feels better, comes out again next week, pop it back in. Right? So then I'm, then I'm like, okay, how do I completely challenge this person's wealth? <laughs> <laughs> they, they see it as something so basic. And, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. That chiropractor is popping something back in space. I'm like, look, if your spine pops out of place, You've got really important tissues that run through the spinal canal that supply 
you know, sensory and motor function to your limbs, to your genitals, etc. Now, you don't want that popping out of place. And if it did pop out of place, you don't want me jumping on your back and popping it back into place. If it pops out of place, you better be in A&E getting it looked at properly uh, because that's not the way it works. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, man. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the we spoke about the internet and how it's maturing in the next kind of step of uh, of where the internet is going. And that's where you're playing around at the moment. Um, you're experimenting with Web3 technology as it purports to uh, health um, and uh, health tech. Can you talk a little bit about what you're kind of what you're focusing on at the moment, what interests you and what your plans are? So obviously I come from a uh, pain, injury management, rehabilitation background. So my my key interest would be to how do we um, use these technologies to streamline and get better outcomes for, for patients, uh, reduce wait times, um, improve access to care, uh, make care accessible worldwide. Um, so we're you know, really looking into... Um, automation AI um, looking into how we can integrate um, virtual reality and augmented reality technologies into into clinical practice um, and a lot of what I'm going to be discussing on my podcast will be around emerging technology in general and how that integrates into medical healthcare um, and how we could improve practice moving forward. Uh, so my specific interest, I want to essentially be, I want to exist, you know, as, as we get to this point where technology is coming here and healthcare is here, I want to be here where my face is, right in the middle of it. Um, <laughs> I want to be right in the middle of it, understanding both and building something meaningful that covers both areas where they meet. Now, what that looks like at the moment, we're playing with lots of different things. Um, and speaking to lots of different developers and etc with lots going on uh, and how what what the what products we end up releasing etc over a period of time will change we i don't know how it's going to go at the moment but essentially that's where we are amazing so just uh adding tech entrepreneur onto the the myriad of stuff that you've you've accomplished so far is uh like in, in, incredible and we're looking forward to i mean i'm obviously someone who is also at the kind of trying to be at the forefront of tech and has previously been at the forefront of healthcare um i'm still i'm still very interested in that um and so i'm going to be following following along um you're you're dropping a podcast in a couple of months time is that correct <clears throat> yeah that's, that's that's the plan so the plan is to launch in quarter two of this year um at the moment we are building out all of the content, arranging all the guests, getting the getting the um, meetings booked in so we can speak to them, um, arranging the studio, all this type of stuff's getting all done in the background. Um, but I'm super excited about getting involved in it. Uh, I, I've always, like, I'm always, healthcare is interesting because I've, I've always been, I understand that, you know, working with patients, Day, day to day uh, that we can really impact people's lives um, now what I'm more interested in is how do I I know that I can do that on an individual level or even with a small team right but I'm really fascinated on how do I how do I impact much more how do I create a bigger impression a bigger impact and how do how do so how do we make improvements I'm always going to be looking to make improvements in places how do we reach more people? How do we get the message out? Um, so that's what excites me. It gives me the energy to, to push forward through the next few years, for sure. Amazing. Well, I mean, I'm excited to keep on playing around in the same kind of arena as you. And um, yeah, it's uh, uh, like for me, um, my passions are human performance and business performance. And I've said this before, but there really isn't anyone um, that I know who really embodies that more than than you, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to like speak to you about all this stuff today. And uh, I mean, I really hope that we can get you back on uh, at some point in the future. Yeah, mate, it's been it's been a pleasure hopping on. I was I was excited about getting getting onto the mic today and talking to you. Uh, 
been a while since we caught up. Well, yeah. caught up mid middle of last year, was it, or something like that? It's gone. Man, yeah, yeah, it's been it's, it's, it's been it's been it's been a while. Yeah, it's been uh, it's gone on very very fast, and um, yeah, hopefully this year. It's going to go a little bit slower. I'd like it to, uh, you know, life goes too fast. So I'd like it to slow down, but um, I'm going to put all of your information in the show description notes, as well as all of the links that we've spoken about, the resources um, and stuff that we've spoken about will all be in there. And um, please go follow Dale because he's going to be on an incredible journey and his podcast is no doubt going to be incredible uh, as well. So yeah, Dale, thank you very much for joining me, mate. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you haven't already done so, hit the like button down below. Make sure to subscribe so that you can learn from the very best that I'm going to be interviewing at the Summit Club. If you didn't know this already, I also have another podcast called The Unorthodox Podcast that I do with my co-founders, Liam and Mark over at Unorthodox. We're a Web3 marketing consultancy. If you want to go check it out, it's quite a lot of fun. If you want to learn a bit more about crypto and everything Web3, that's the place to come check it out. We interview some of the most interesting people within Web3 and also executives across some of the biggest brands on the planet. Come and join us. The links are also going to be down below in the description and I'll see you next time.